Please, won't you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. On Palm Sunday, the multitudes followed Jesus into Jerusalem for the festival of Passover, knowing their worth, knowing how beloved they were. They shouted, Hosanna, a prayer plea of praise, meaning, I beg you to save. A little different than the word hallelujah. Hosanna means I beg you to save. Jesus' ride into Jerusalem was a provocative and disruptive protest march signifying a regime change. God's people had been praying for this day, having lived with a Roman knee on their necks for far too long. It was Passover. This was the week the Jewish people remembered God's liberation God's dream for a world made whole with feasting and storytelling. This was the week the Jews celebrated their chosenness, their belovedness in the eyes of their God. This was the week they remembered the land of milk and honey they were promised. This was the week that the Jews celebrated a God who led them out of slavery and bondage and through the gates of freedom. And when people are reminded that they are still in chains and they were promised more, they can get out of hand. They have a new leader, Jesus. The one who comes in the name of the Lord, the one who was consistently reminding the voiceless ones that they are worthy and maybe not so powerless after all. The one who came to bring good news to the poor. The one who would save them from the excesses and ravages of empire. Yes, it was a dangerous week to be in Jerusalem. Jesus was born during a time of peace, but it came at the cost of heavy-handed oppression. The Pax Romana, or the Roman peace, existed only because Rome squashed all dissent. In Rome, the peace was kept with force and displays of intimidating military might. The Romans built a fortress in the shadow of the Jews' most holy place, the temple, and stood over it with 600 armed soldiers at all times. And while Jesus was entering the city from the east, Pilate, the governor of Judea, was marching into the city from the west. His parade was a show of force to remind the people of Jerusalem that Rome was in charge. Insurrection was in the air, and this procession of imperial power, the long arm of the law, was prepared to do whatever it took to stop it. But Jesus was not to be deterred, and so he led his followers in another kind of parade. He took his disciples to steal him a donkey and a colt. Untie them and bring them to me, he said. If anyone asks, just tell them that God needs them. Jesus had been a well-kept secret up to this point on purpose. Palm Sunday was his day to reveal himself at last in a piece of subversive street theater meant to mock the Roman authorities with a fulfillment of the prophecy from Zechariah. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. In Matthew's description, Jesus gets so literal with the text that it says he somehow mounts both the donkey and the colt at the same time. I have no idea how one does that. We couldn't even get the donkey inside the building today. Can you imagine getting a donkey like that to cooperate with a colt and having Jesus ride in on both of them? I have no idea how one does that. But Jesus is the son of God, and so he's like, hold my beer, right? (laughs) 
There were no fancy saddles and horses and chariots for Jesus, just a donkey and a colt with some coats laid over it to ease his seat. This procession didn't look at all like a kingly procession. There was no gleaming armor or guards or weapons, just people spreading their coats on the ground and waving palms in the air. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He has come at last to fight our enemies. He will return to us our worth. Hosanna, I beg you to save. But then something unexpected happens. Jesus doesn't go to the Roman fortress to fight the enemy occupiers. He goes instead to the temple, the heart of his own religion, and drives the people out who are providing a service of convenience for people coming to worship. I noticed that you all were getting confused when Roy started reading that part of the scripture. He went on, right, beyond verse 11. That was on purpose. I heard you all shuffling, like, where is it? Did Helen mess up the bulletin? It's my fault. I wanted you to know what happens next, right? He went to the temple and he drives out the people who are providing a service of convenience for people coming to worship. He entered the temple area and drove out all those who were buying and selling there. And what did he do? What did he do? He overturned the tables, right? He flipped over, he flipped over the tables of the money changers and the benches of those who are selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a call, uh, called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers, he says. The practice of exchanging money for animal sacrifice on the altar makes Jesus furious enough to flip the tables. The Messiah did come at Passover to judge the ungodly, it turns out, but to their surprise, he ended up judging the religious leaders who were making money off of the poor people who came to pray. When the Messiah comes into town, he doesn't just find evil in the heart of the enemy, but in the heart of his own people. You're interested in keeping your building open and your wallets lined, but I'm interested in the people, he announced. For everyone born a place at this table, whether you have money or not. It is the children in the temple who recognize him right away as the Messiah. They cry out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. It is the children in the temple who are begging Jesus to save. Do you hear what they are saying? The priests and scribes ask. It is a rhetorical question. They want Jesus to stop those kids. They are speaking blasphemy. After all, these words are reserved for the Messiah and perhaps for God himself. Jesus should know better than to let these kids get out of hand in the house of God. Jesus responds with a question back to the leaders. He asks, in essence, if they had never read the psalm, the psalms, or specifically Psalm 8, verse 2. This was a common Jewish way of making a point. Jesus references a Greek translation of the verse. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the adventure. Listen to the children, he says. They get it. You don't. My seventh grader rarely engages me in conversation. Is she here? Oh, good, she's not here. <laughs> but if she were here, she would say, Robin, like Cecilia just did. She's also incredibly disrespectful. She calls me Robin. Anyway, she rarely engages me in conversation. My family can back me up on this one. Um, she got into the car on Friday, though, and said to me, Mom, did you know that there have been more school shootings than weeks of school in 2023? Apparently, she was right, because I looked it up, and this is the 13th week of the year and the Nashville shooting was the 19th shooting at an American school or university in 2023 in which at least one person was wounded, according to the account. 
It was the deadliest attack since the May attack in Uvalde, Texas, which left 21 dead. And there have been 42 K through 12 school shootings since Uvalde, 42. So to be honest, I don't invite conversation with my own kids about school shootings anymore, especially if it happens more than once a week. I have read all of the literature entitled things like how to talk to your children about scary things, but there are so many tragedies involving violence and terrorism on a daily basis that I gave up trying to address them all with my kids long ago. Parents, is this true of you too? Or do you address it every time? The adults aren't helping mom, Eloisa said. Nothing has changed and I'm scared to go to school. And I said immediately, I can see why you feel that way, but look at the statistics, Eloisa. It is still exceedingly unlikely that you will die at school. You're safe there. You're more likely to die in a car accident, I said. Firearm deaths are now the leading cause of death in children surpassing car accidents, Eloisa said. Stop minimizing how I feel. You're right, I said, I'm sorry. Of course you're scared. My child is shouting, Hosanna, I beg you to save while I minimize how she feels. And like the donkey, Jesus is demanding that I be untied from what holds me back because the Lord needs me. Meanwhile, the children are flooding the Tennessee state capitol. Have you seen this on the news? The children are demanding lawmakers in Tennessee stiffen gun laws in their state. They carry signs that say, I'm nine, like the three children who died at the Covenant Christian School this week, like my son Isaac, who is nine, like my daughter Cecilia was six in 2012, when all of those beautiful six-year-olds were killed at Sandy Hook Elementary. My children are telling me to stop numbing myself and minimizing their feelings. Out of the mouths of babes, the Lord's name will be proclaimed. My children are shouting, Hosanna, I beg you to save our lives. And meanwhile, the leaders are trying to silence them because they worship the NRA's blood money and not God. Kevin Miller says when the Messiah rides into town, he finds evil things right in the heart of his people. He finds it in the things we accept, in the things we don't think a thing about. He wants our worship, but he wants even more than that. He wants the daily worship of a changed life. He wants the daily worship of us lifting up others around us, welcoming them as God would. When Jesus returns in triumph to judge the ungodly, he will start with us. So no, the answer is not just one thing. It's all the things. Common sense gun laws, better mental health care, especially for our crumbling teenagers, leaving our houses, loving our neighbors, paying attention to people who are slipping into some sort of disconnected antisocial abyss, which is all of us, teaching our children that other children are not to be feared or hated because of the way they were born, interrupting hate-soaked Christian racism and nationalism, homophobia and transphobia, refusing to participate in the absolutely, utterly ridiculous culture wars that the politicians have fabricated to line their wallets and keep their jobs with deadly consequences. The gun lobby, those who stoke our division for profit, are corrupt politicians who care only about their own power and not about our children's lives. Hosanna, I beg you to save. It's going to take all of us, and we have the power of God's salvation running our engines. When people are reminded that they are still in chains and they were promised more, they can get out of hand. You can get out of hand too 
It's what Jesus would do. Bring a donkey if you can get it out of the truck. <laughs> I'm going to close with these lines from Amanda Gordon's poem, Gorman's poem, Hymn for the Hurting. This alarm is how we know we must be altered, that we must differ or die, that we must triumph or try. Thus, while hate cannot be terminated, it can be transformed into a love that lets us live. May we not just grieve, but give. May we not just ache, but act. May our signed right to bear arms never blind our sight from shared harm. May we choose our children over chaos. May another innocent never be lost. Maybe everything hurts, our hearts shadowed and strange, but only when everything hurts may everything change. Amen.